Good evening, dear friends. Tonight I will talk about the fifth lecture by Rudolf Steiner in the cycles of lectures that Rudolf Steiner gave on the Gospel of Matthew in Bern, Switzerland in 1910. I'll do this to place into a literary historical context the lecture cycle on the Gospel of Matthew and the related lecture cycle on the Gospel of Luke that Steiner gave in Basel in 1909, just prior to the Matthew lectures. I hope that this short presentation will give you some insight into the context, complexity, and background of Rudolf Steiner's Christology. Our section meetings recently, uh, Robert McDermott lectured on Rudolf Steiner's reading of the Christian mystery, and Professor McDermott has done a lecture in which he compared the Christology of Rudolf Steiner to the Christology of Teilhard de Chardin, and you can find that lecture on the Literary Arts website or on the Literary Arts YouTube channel, if you're interested. My interest tonight is similar, but slightly different. I'm interested in how Rudolf Steiner reads Buddhism in respect to Christianity and in respect to the emerging conflict within theosophy at this modernist moment in the 20th century, just prior to the catastrophe of World War I. I'll try to keep things lively and upbeat, and by the time we're done, I hope that you will at least have a sense for why I find this complicated topic interesting from a literary standpoint. And let me just very quickly explain what I mean by literary in this instance. I am not going to craft an argument for the theological, philosophical, or spiritual religious merits of Steiner's reading of the Gospels. Rather, I will approach this text as I would, for example, approach a play by Shakespeare. First, I will ask, what does the text explicitly say? Second, for whom was the text written or spoken? Third, how does the constructed explicit meaning and the constructed literary context contribute to the text's more complex poetic meanings? And if the text is very dense in the way that one of Shakespeare's plays or sonnets are poetically dense, then, of course, we cannot expect to arrive at some sanctioned canonical interpretation of the text's meaning. We instead, hopefully, with our poetic questioning, will have opened our hearts and spiritual imaginations, and thus have made ourselves, with this openness to the mystery, a bit more vulnerable to the high literary adventure of being human. So, with that as introduction, I'll start the presentation with some words by Rudolf Steiner that you will find as the front piece to Peter Selk's exhaustive biography on Rudolf Steiner, which appears in English in a multi-volume edition published by Steiner Books. I'm using the front piece quote from the Steiner Books ebook, volume three. And then after this quote, as I mentioned, I'll proceed in a more playful and uh, way, so to speak, with a dramatic skit, a short humorous dialogue. It's meant to be lighthearted, but earnest. For a number of reasons, this spiritual scientific movement cannot yet reveal itself as it will in the future. One of these reasons is that it first needs to establish itself within a particular group of people. It will naturally have to do this in a language suited to this people. As the right conditions evolve over time, spiritual science will find the right words that speak to other circles as well. Rudolf Steiner, 
1906. Okay, now the skit. The dialogue is called The Elevator Pitch. Imagine you need to explain, in a very short elevator ride, what this lecture on Matthew is all about. You're an enthusiastic young spiritual scientist with the idea that you want to make a movie and you have a chance to pitch your project to a powerful movie producer who can make things happen. And you see the producer at a hotel and you jump into the elevator with her. This is the elevator pitch. What do you say? You speak two numbers, 42 and 77. If the producer goes, aha, got it, send me the script, then you know that you're talking to someone who is conversant with the Western occult esoteric wisdom tradition, and in particular, Rudolf Steiner and anthroposophy. I don't know, maybe she's a Rosicrucian. Lots of Hollywood folks are into Kabbalah, so why not? But the producer in the elevator doesn't get it. She says, Which floor do you want, kid? 42 or 77? And anyway, this hotel only has 14 floors. Young person, step back. You are invading my space. And why are you wearing a peat vest? However, she is a numerologist, and she uses tarot cards, and she trains as a psychic, And she sees something worthy in your aura, and she's just interested enough to invite you to walk with her and explain. I don't know, maybe she's a shaman and she has an intuition, but she's more comfortable with you outside the elevator. So you get out, and now you've got five more minutes of her time. So... Instead of launching into a Bible explication, I don't know, you know, once upon a time in Eden, you cut right to the 20th century and to the dramatic human conflict. You say, imagine we're in the year 1910. The year 1910 falls almost in the middle of Rudolf Steiner's career as a teacher of spiritual science. If we go back 10 years to September 1900, we find that this was the moment when Rudolf Steiner began his career with a lecture on Goethe's fairy tale of the green snake and beautiful lily, a lecture that he gave on Michaelmas, September 29th, 1900, to an audience of theosophists. It was a very important lecture on a very important topic, and it's a puzzling text a text that Rudolf Steiner called the germinal seed of the anthroposophical movement. Uh, Those are strong words. Rudolf Steiner worked with this fairy tale intensively for many years, and he used Goethe's very important fairy tale as the inspiration for his mystery dramas. Okay, Sherlock, get to the point, says the producer. She's walking fast and you see that you are losing her interest, and worse, that she is doodling on her iPhone. So you say, if we go forward 10 years from 1910, the year of the lectures on Matthew, to September 1920, we find Rudolf Steiner giving a whole series of lectures on the social question or social forms. He had left the Gospels behind and had moved his attention to the practical question of a threefold social order, and he was entering that period of strenuous criticism and conflict and attack that led to the burning of the first Goetheanum in 1922. The fascists and nationalists were banging their drums. The beast was slouching toward Bethlehem. We're approaching a moment of crisis. But ten years earlier, 1910, the year of Matthew, was the climax of a golden decade. Rudolf Steiner had found an audience in theosophy. And thanks to a question posed by Marie von Sievers, his future wife, he began to teach a version of theosophy soon to be known as anthroposophy. He had found an audience that encouraged him and appreciated him. But in 1910, everything was theosophy. 
and the people interested in Rudolf Steiner called themselves theosophists, and they were in a theosophical society, as was Marie. Now, Rudolf Steiner knew all about theosophy, but he had reservations. He had a different slant on theosophy that was a restatement or revision of theosophy that he called anthroposophy. He didn't feel comfortable with the Anglo-American Theosophical Society or with its leadership or with its emphasis on Asian wisdom traditions, and he thought that theosophy needed to ground itself in the Western Central European wisdom traditions and the Christian mystery. And Marie was of the same mind, And she posed the all-important, significant question to Rudolf Steiner. What about the Christ? This question was an opportunity. It opened doors. But thus, we have the seeds of conflict. And indeed, just before World War I, the anthroposophists split from the theosophists. Now, uh, you see that the producer has put away her iPhone because now you've reached the limo that has come to pick her up. She's ready to bolt, so you have to think fast. You show her a picture of the Goetheanum, and you say, Okay, skip ahead to 1920. In 1920, anthroposophy stands on a firm methodological foundation based on Goetheanism. Oh, don't, don't worry what Goetheanism means. I'll get to that later. The future looks bright. The world is a mess, but, you know, the world is always a mess. World War I just ended, World War II, and our present problems were in the offing. The Nazis were organizing. Aha! You see that the mention of Nazis has caught her attention. So, you quickly add... Anthroposophy is attracting the youth, all kinds of young, energetic, talented, idealistic, brilliant young people from all kinds of countries, because anthroposophy now speaks to the burning concerns of youth after the disaster of World War I. The youth want action, renewal, hope, world community. But there are signs of impending disaster. Conflicts between the outer world and anthroposophy. Misunderstandings and attacks by the enemies of spiritual science. And conflicts within anthroposophy between the old members and the youth. Then, on December 31st, 1922, an arsonist burns the first Goetheanum. You show her the picture again. And this time she actually looks at it. She says, uh, we're talking conflict, right? East versus West, Germany, Russia, early 20th century, fascists in the bushes, Anglo-Americans versus Germans. Go on, go on, more backstory. Uh, But what about this 42 and 77? I still don't get it. Come on, get in the car with me. We'll talk a little more. So you jump in the car and you say, great, we're almost there. Flashback to 1910. In 1910, we are nearly at the moment in 1912 when the students of Rudolf Steiner, who called themselves anthroposophists, broke away from the Theosophical Society and from the students of Rudolf Steiner in Central Europe who still felt at home in the Theosophical Society and who called themselves theosophists. Oh, wait a minute, she objects. Why did they do that? I thought you said theosophists were Steiner's appreciative audience. Didn't they give him his breakthrough moment? Isn't that what you said? And you say, that was then, this is now. It's 1910 and things are not going well. In 1912, the Anthroposophical Society was founded. In 1913, the Theosophical Society withdrew the charter of the German section of Theosophy as it had existed under Rudolf Steiner's leadership since 1902. It was like a divorce. She says, who divorced whom? You ignore that. You say, a key conflict that led to this break between anthroposophy and theosophy 
was the argument over the meaning and importance of Christ. And a subsidiary argument was over the meaning and importance of Maitreya Buddha and the relative meaning meaning of Buddhism vis-a-vis Christianity and the Western esoteric occult tradition. There were other problems, but let's focus on those. It makes sense, then, that in this Matthew lecture from September 5, 1910, we find Rudolf Steiner speaking about the Maitreya Buddha, or Bodhisattva, and about what he calls the College of Bodhisattvas. He's talking to theosophists who will soon be anthroposophists. Uh, The producer says, okay, hold it, Shakespeare. Now I am confused. What Buddha? What bodhisattvas? What college? I went to Stanford. I know about Buddha. I trekked through Nepal. I lived in Dharamsala, and I sat with his holiness. I took vows. I practiced zazen. Don't all religions point to the summit of the same mountain? Hey, do you have to be some kind of Christian to get into this treehouse that you're talking about? Are you in a cult or a New Age church? You say, I like your passion. All will be clear. And you press on. This idea of bodhisattva is central to the lecture in 1910. Rudolf Steiner refers to a suprahuman spiritual concept of bodhisattvas. These are exalted spiritual beings who have no equivalent in the human world. They inspire humans and help them. Along with the Maitreya Bodhisattva, the future Buddha, other bodhisattvas are recognized in Buddhist traditions, such as, for example, Manjushri and Avalokiteshvara. Here's a quote. Wait a minute, wait a minute says the producer. Stop already with the college lecture. When I was in Dharamsala, I studied with geishas. And when I came back, I took a bodhisattva vow that I would tread the path of spiritual development for the benefit of all sentient beings, and that I would refuse to abandon this world of pain and suffering at any time during this incarnation or any future incarnation until all sentient beings are enlightened. It's an impossible idealistic vow of compassion, but that's the bodhisattva vow and bodhicitta teaching, and I believe it. I was told that bodhisattvas are not gods. They are human beings who have taken the compassionate altruistic vow to tread the spiritual path of enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings. I thought Buddha was only a human being. I thought Buddha said that he brought a human teaching for human beings to relieve suffering, like a physician. Right, right, you say, but things get confusing, even in Buddhism, for example. There are passages in the sutras that identify Buddha as a suprahuman being, but there are other passages and arguments that Buddha is neither God nor human being, but something else entirely. The Theravadan school puts emphasis on the human beingness of the Buddha. On the other hand, the term Tathagata, oh, just get on with it, she complains, I've got a lunch date with Tom Hanks. So you say, right. So, when Rudolf Steiner talked to the theosophist about bodhisattvas in 1910, he didn't reference anything that you might know from current Buddhist practice, like the compassionate and altruistic bodhisattva vow to become an enlightened human being for the benefit of all sentient beings. People in 1910 did not know as much about Buddhism as we know now. They were very head-oriented, very theoretical, and almost none of them knew about or practiced Buddhist meditation techniques, for example, like Satipatthana. Working with the breath was frowned upon, and you might say from an epistemological point of view, okay, got it, she says, thumbs up. 
big change in global culture, seismic shift in understanding from 1910 until now, deconstruction of Eurocentric, colonialist, racial, gender, bias, and phallocentrism, emphasis now on human beings and spirit I, doing and practice, compassion, skillful means, embodiment, atonement, being in the world. You say, that's right. In fact, I can show you a video on my iPhone. I have a video of, of the Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara that the literary arts section made in 2020 at the beginning of COVID. This presents the ideal of the Bodhisattva, and it's similar to what Steiner presents in his lecture. She says, hold the movie, Bertolucci. And I don't know, what's a literary arts section? Anyway, I'm bored. All this historical intellectual stuff is boring. I need some doing. I like to practice. Where's the human conflict? Hey, show me that burning building again. I like that shot. By now, you and the producer have spent many minutes in conversation. It's a lucky break, but frankly, you're losing steam. However, the producer is intrigued. She says, yep, I like that burning building, but I still don't grok all those details about 42 and 77. Anyway, I do feel something karmic when I look at that statue of the Bodhisattva. Come on, wrap this up, kiddo. 42 and 77. I've got a lunch date. Come on, you can do it. So you say, in the Matthew Gospel, there are 42 stages of generational development from Abraham to Jesus. In the Luke Gospel, which Rudolf Steiner refers to in this lecture, a lecture cycle on the Luke Gospel from 1909, remember I mentioned that, there are 77 stages of generational development from Adam to Jesus. In each generational series, however, there is an extra generational step. 42 implies 49, 7 times 7, and 77 implies 84, 12 times 7. Uh, you don't need to worry about this, however. The Essenes comprehended this entire mystery. And she says, Essenes? Excuse me? Oh, think Dead Sea Scrolls, guys with beards in the desert, very strenuous spiritual order. Perhaps John the Baptist was an Essene. But, she says, weren't the Essenes Jewish? Yes! The Essenes understood the esoteric significance of 42 and 77, and they practiced techniques of initiatory spiritual development that allowed them to participate in the mysteries of the 42 and the 77. They aspired to initiation in those mysteries. The goal, according to the lecture in 1910, is to prepare for the Christ. But in fact, if we really want to understand how this works, Christ is directing the entire mystery all along from the spiritual world. Wait a minute, wait a minute, Shakespeare, says the producer. And uh, you see that she is texting again. So let me get this straight, she says. The Essenes with beards in the desert, these dudes are Jewish, but they're working with the bald-headed Buddhists and with some bodhisattvas, I don't know, in a college. And it's all produced and directed by the Christ uh, is the Pope involved in this? You say, it's not so simple. According to the lecture in 1910, a high mysterious being works under inspiration of the Christ in the stream of time, going back to very ancient moments of earth evolution. The earth is a spiritual being. She puts down her iPhone. She says, Okay, got it. Now you're talking some common sense. We're in an earth moment. You say, yes, the earth as a spiritual being and the human being as a spiritual being 
as cosmos, as anthropos, participate in a long process of history and spiritual evolution that leads to the event at Bethlehem, which leads to Golgotha, the turning point of time. It's an idea that we find in Hegel. She says, yeah, I'm hungry too. Let's split this bagel. Hegel, not bagel, but yeah, okay, I'll take a pickle. Karl Jaspers called this moment an axial age, but Jaspers was careful to distinguish between Christian myth and soteriology and a secular global humanist view of history. Okay, whatever, she says. Now you're really losing her. So you quickly add... According to the philosopher Karl Jaspers, who coined the phrase axial age, this was an exceptional time in human history. The old mythologies were waning, and the new mythologies had not yet taken hold. Uh, This is the time of Buddha and Jesus. It's the birth of Western philosophy and the teaching of the Dharma. When the spiritual emphasis, East and West, was not on the gods and received tradition, but on the human being, spiritually speaking, it was a global moment of freedom, one might argue. Well, if you say so, Horatio, says the producer, but I still don't get the 42 and 77, so... Matthew counted kinfolk one way, and Luke counted kin another way. Same difference, right? We still get to Jesus on the cross. You say, no, no, that's what I'm trying to explain. There were two Jesus children. That's what this lecture is all about. One Jesus child is presented by Matthew, and the other Jesus child is presented by Luke. Two Jesus children, says the producer. Say what? What are we talking? Twins? IVF? Game of clones? But there is only one Jesus on the cross, the last time I checked. I thought this was about Buddhas and Bodhisattvas and single Jewish guys with beards in the desert in college classrooms. Yes, you say. That is the meaning of 42 and 77. The Gospel of Matthew explains the mystery of the 42 generational steps to one Jesus child called the Solomonic Jesus. And the lectures on the Gospel of Luke, given in 1909, explain the 77 generational steps to the other Jesus child, the Nathanic Jesus. Rudolf Steiner's lectures on the Matthew Gospel and his lectures on the Luke Gospel explain this mystery. He reconciles the lineages in the two Gospels. Aha, but, says the producer, there was only one Jesus Christ on the cross. And anyway, Mel Gibson made that movie. You say, okay, right, but the real drama, the real conflict, the real mystery, lie in the backstory. And that's what this 42 and 77 is all about. It is the mystery of the two Jesus children, as Rudolf Steiner unpacks it in his lectures. Aha, says the producer. Okay, call my assistant. This is deep. Set up an appointment and bring a script. She starts to get out of the car. But she takes your copy of the Matthew Lectures, and she says, You know, show me that picture of the Bodhisattva again. There's something very special about that statue. I feel touched, very moved, like when I went to Rome and saw the Pieta. In fact, hey, why don't you show me that video about the Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara that you mentioned? Come on, kid, quick, get out your iPhone. And that ends the conversation and tonight's lecture summary. Thank you for your attention and for your interest in Romanticism 
and for your interest in the section for the literary arts and humanities. Good night. The great Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara looked down into the many hells and saw that the many hells were filled with suffering. A great vow spontaneously arose from the heart. I will liberate all beings from the sufferings of hell. And so, through countless ages, the great Bodhisattva labored until at last the unimaginable task of mercy had been accomplished. And when at last the unimaginable task of mercy had been accomplished, the great Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara ceased from eons of heroic exertion. The Bodhisattva wiped aside the glistening diamond beads of sweat and looked down into the empty hills and smiled. Here and there a curling wisp of smoke now and then the clatter of rock within a darkness, but otherwise peace. The vast raging fires had been extinguished. The deep iron cauldrons had been quenched. Sweet silence wafted like incense through the endless hells. The demons had vanished, redeemed. They too, with numberless sentient beings, liberated by the mighty deeds of the Compassionate One. Ah, but then, what was that sound? A scream of anger, a cry of pain. Confusion, hatred, greed, silence and moaning. Flames shot forth, smoke billowed. Bolts of lightning split the air and thunder deeply resounded. The earth groaned and the blood-drunk cauldrons began to boil again madly as once they had boiled. The radiant smile faded from the great Bodhisattva's compassionate face. Once again, the endless hells were full. The demons had returned, and with them, numberless beings. In less than an instant, all was as it ever once had been. The heart of the great Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara filled with sorrow. But then, as suddenly as this vision of suffering arose, the head of the great Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara burst into many heads like a tree bursting forth into blossom. The arms of the great Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara became many arms, like a tree stretching forth toward heaven. The feet of the great Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara rooted firmly into earth. Like a tree of vast age and enduring wisdom. The one thousand heads of the Bodhisattva espied the horizon to the east, west, north, and south. The one thousand eyes 
of the Bodhisattva beheld the suffering of numberless sentient beings. The 1,000 arms of the Bodhisattva extended with compassion to all those in need of mercy, to the east, west, north, and south. Thus reposing, the great Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara began once more the unending task. Mm -hmm.